Hello everyone, welcome. I'm Rene Ruiz, Area Director of Business Development with Civitas Senior Living. And we have the pleasure today of uh, meeting with Dr. Mark Carlson. Uh, Dr. Carlson, it's uh, such a pleasure to meet you. I know that uh, you've got a long history in the medical profession. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and your different practices. Okay, thanks Renee, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, my medical career started back in the 90s, and I break my career into three segments. I had the formal training segment, and then I had my years in oncology. And then about a decade ago, I transitioned over to geriatrics. And uh, long story there, I won't bore you with the details, but each phase of along the way, um, technology has played a role. And now I uh, am the founder and medical director for BWellMD, which is my geriatric practice. But we also have BWell Clinical Studies, which is a clinical research practice. Um, and the, the purpose for that is to focus on elders and to do, help do the clinical research that is needed, especially in the world of dementia, but also in the world of vaccines and other treatments for elders. And so BWellMD is located here in Austin, uh, the greater Austin area, and uh, BWell Clinical Studies is, has a location in Round Rock, Texas, as well as Lincoln, Nebraska. Okay, very nice. Um, so our topic today is the intersection of senior health and technology and how that translates into making the lives of seniors easier, uh, much more fun. They can get out and be more engaged with their friends and truly make new and wonderful memories without having to worry as much on monitoring their day-to-day -day health. Um, as I mentioned earlier, technology has played a, an important role in my career starting from the beginning. And when I first got done with my training, I wanted the technology to make my job easier, meaning uh, we were still doing everything by hand, everything was paper, and we saw on the horizon the power of the computer. Um, but healthcare was a little bit slow, not a little bit, a lot slow. And so when I got done with my training, that was in 1997, I wanted to start out in my clinical practice where I had everything on, on the computer and I got rid of the paper. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, we weren't ready for that. Uh, your, your audience may know this, uh, but the electronic health record was really in its infancy back in 97. And I uh, went through many iterations of the electronic health record, and I loved it at first. I was energetic and young at the time, and I thought, oh boy, this is really going to be special. And uh, 10, 15 years later, oh boy, it beat me up. <laughs> and so anyway, um, in the world of oncology, it did make a difference. It made me a better clinician, but it was very difficult to implement. And then um, I moved into geriatrics about a decade ago. And during that training period, I grasped onto this idea that the technology can help elders maintain their independence, their vitality, and stay at home. And over the last decade, that has been one of the primary foci of BWellMD. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then, of course, with the technology that we utilize for vaccine development, drug development, and uh, just everything in medicine, uh, we are finally to the point where we are seeing more and more things become available. And uh, the potential for not only a medical practice like Be Well, uh, but also for elders mm -hmm. um, everywhere around the world, not only in the United States, but uh, everywhere really is dramatic. And it's just, it's just exciting to be part of medicine at this point uh, in history where, where we really are um, seeing, seeing the advantages and... Uh, the fruits of all this uh, work over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Okay, that's tremendous. So tell me, what problems related to healthcare does an aging society present? So when, when I transitioned from medical oncology to geriatrics, I intentionally looked at uh, where there was need and where I might be able to make a difference and what I enjoyed doing. 
And all of those questions had geriatrics as part of an answer. Okay. Um, the demographics, of course, were, were well aware of the baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the baby boomers started retiring about a decade ago, a little over a decade ago. And uh, they are going to continue to retire over the next decade or so. And this population of elders is, is bigger than any other group uh, in history. And they are changing everything that they touch. Describe. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, if we look at the the baby boomers as they've gone through the years, you know, back in the '60s, they uh, they changed society, mm -hmm. and then in the '70s and '80s, um, as they were maturing, they changed the way uh, adulthood looked. Okay. And then uh, now they're becoming elders, and they're changing elderhood as well. Um, uh, one of the examples that I oftentimes cite is um, uh, a Depends commercial with, a, uh, with an elder um, uh, looking very attractive, very, uh, very appealing. Right. And, uh, you know, adult diapers. Uh, who would think that that could right. be an uh, attractive commercial? But they've done it. And uh, hallelujah, more power to them. Absolutely. And as I, as I think about the baby boomers and the booming number of elders, um, they, they present a, a particular challenge for us because as we know, as we get older, all of us, uh, with very few exceptions, start collecting problems, mm -hmm. medical problems. And we almost always need additional help as we get into our 70s, 80s, 90s, and the centenarians among us. And the centenarians, those that are 100 and above, is one of the biggest growing groups. Okay, um, is that? Yeah. Uh, not only here in the United States, but around the world. Okay. And as we age, um, as we need more and more help, technology can be a key element of helping those elders maintain their vitality and uh, maintain their independence. And I have yet to meet the elder who tells me that they want to retire and live in a, in a uh, long-term care facility. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to stay at home. Sure. And if I can help them in some way, uh, either with my medical skills or by helping them incorporate technology, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can technology really help solve any of these problems? Oh, I think, I think without a doubt. Okay. Uh, there's no question that technology already is helping to solve these problems. First of all, um, technology uh, in medicine has been wonderfully exploited and utilized um, primarily on the side of uh, new treatments, uh, for instance, new drug development, vaccine development. Of course, we just ended a pandemic and the, uh, the advances in vaccine development mm -hmm. are, um, are pretty much aware to everybody. And, uh, but it, but it goes beyond that. The drugs that, are, that have been developed and the technology, the, um, the computer power, computing power that has allowed us to develop these new drugs, especially in the world of cardiology, oncology. Um, I'll give you a quick story. I've, sure. got a, I've got a family member right now, and um, her cancer has a particular mutation and that particular mutation, there is now a targeted drug available uh, to treat her cancer. And it's, uh, it's something that five years ago was not available. But because of the advances in personalized medicine and mm -hmm. these targeted therapies um, and, and the advances that all this technology has afforded us, mm -hmm. we are now able to treat her and her prognosis a decade ago, uh, she might not even be alive uh, this far into it, but now uh, she's getting a great response and it's uh, rather amazing uh, what this one tiny little pill, not chemotherapy, not something that's making her ill, mm -hmm. but just a pill, one pill that she takes every day and it's, uh, it's uh, changed her life. That's terrific. Uh, thank you. That's great. It's, it's fascinating, actually, uh, all the advancements that we've made and, and uh, to see them come to life and to see them start to help our society members, especially our, our, you know, our aging senior population. Yeah. Um, you'd mentioned that technology integration in healthcare. Uh, what is that exactly? 
So technology integration is basically what I was hoping for when I finished my training uh, 25 years ago. Okay. Uh, meaning I wanted the technology to seamlessly and uh, effortlessly on my part mm -hmm. to do my work. Okay. And uh, of course that wasn't realistic then, but we are, we are seeing more and more of that all the time. So technology integration is, um, is just using the health information technology, the information technology to incorporate that into healthcare. And uh, healthcare was kind of slow to uh, auto, uh, automate and use information technology as compared to other industries. Why is that? Um, and I, I don't, uh, I think I mentioned it before that doctors were kind of dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, we were slow to adopt things that we didn't totally understand. I don't know if that's the right answer, but that's the one that I'll, that I'll give you okay. in your audience today. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we, um, I, th I think in, in all reality though, uh, doctors were so busy being doctors in the hospital, in the exam room, that we didn't take time to... Uh, recognize and incorporate uh, the technology like some other industries. And so I'll give you, I'll give you a, a fact that might uh, bear that out. Uh, back in 1997, when I was looking at those early health record systems to make my job easier in my practice, uh, there was, um, there was a, a particular um, article that I read that industries like manufacturing, law, business, were investing 15, 20% of their annual budgets into information technology okay. uh, leading up to that time over the preceding decade or mm -hmm. two. And healthcare was investing 1% at that time. Wow. And so healthcare, healthcare was behind the curve. But then over a period, over a period of the last 20, 25 years, we finally caught up. And we now recognize that the information technology investment will eventually pay off. And it's going to pay off in the form of metadata and being able to collect information from so many sources in a way that we can analyze and um, use it to make better diagnosis, more accurate diagnosis, and uh, treatments um, in real time. And we're seeing, we're seeing that uh, now where when I first got out of training, that really was just a dream. It's great. Yeah. That's tremendous, actually. Um, in your opinion, what is the biggest contribution of technology in relation to healthcare? So I think I've already mentioned a little bit about things like the drug development, the surgical uh, technologies. Um, I think if anybody's been in a hospital over the last uh, decade, you recognize the incredible amount of technology in every patient room, the amount of um, monitors, the devices that we use to keep track of patients' vital signs and other key parameters that are important in their diagnosis and treatment. And now what we're seeing, and I think on the horizon, that medical grade technology is filtering down into the into the consumer world. Um, and I think the one of the uh, best uh, examples of that is an Apple Watch. I suspect many of your audience members have an Apple Watch on right mm -hmm. now. And when their heart rate goes too fast or they're sitting too long, they get a warning from their Apple Watch that they spurring them on, um, spurring them to do something different. And it's that kind of information that was uh, totally unavailable to us when I was in training and before that. And now we are able to take data like that on an individual level, but also on a population level and act on it, act on it proactively. So we don't wait until somebody has their heart attack. Mm -hmm. uh, we recognize that their parameters, their vital signs are changing in the days and weeks leading up to the heart attack so that we can uh, intervene in a proactive manner and prevent the damage from occurring. Now, we're, we're still a ways away from that, um, but that is on the horizon. And so I think those kind of technologies, that kind of information is what the technology integration is really all about and what uh, high-level high level systems on the uh, health systems uh, uh, parameters 
on the state level, on the federal level, that we're all pushing towards that in order to get that metadata and be able to uh, monitor you on a personal mm -hmm. level, but then know what that means and try to intervene in a proactive manner. Wow. It's scary at the same time, in a way. It is. It is. But uh, I, I think you need to embrace it, right? I mean, because it, in the end, it's, it's meant to, to help, right? Yeah, and I, and I think um, I liken it a little bit to the automatic driving, the automated driving, and the fully autom autom automatic mode of driving. If we could convert everybody in a, in a week from uh, analog driving to digital driving, it would be magic and everybody would love it and it would reduce deaths, it would make us more efficient, etc. But it's this transition period that is so difficult and we are transitioning from the analog world of driving to the digital and we're doing the same thing in the world of medicine and healthcare. We're going from the analog uh, world into the uh, digital world. And once we're fully there, or more fully there than we are now, uh, some of the fear that you and I both share is going to get is going to go away. Okay. Um, but uh, you're right; we've got to we've got to get used to these um, quote unquote intrusions, mm -hmm. and uh, having people look at us over our shoulder digitally is something that um, many of us worry about and we fear. But I am confident that as, uh, as we get better at this, we're going to put the safeguards in place so that we, we do the proper type of monitoring to help you mm -hmm. and do things for you rather than do things to you. Sure. And I'm sure that uh, any time that you're signing up for anything like this, you would be fully aware of, well, the hope is that you'd be fully aware, I'm sure you are, Sure. That, that they're going to be tracking this with the intent of monitoring your, your disease progression or things of that sort. Is that accurate? And Yes, and that, that is accurate. And, uh, of course, we probably have most of us heard about HIPAA mm -hmm. and uh, the protections that the government has put in place regarding health information. And we're learning more and more how to work within the rules of HIPAA so that we can appropriately share information, uh, but then on a population and group level, de-identify information so that it can be used to help us diagnose and treat, mm -hmm. uh, but not, uh, not reveal any personal information about you or yeah. me personally. That's great. Yeah. That's a huge changing uh, factor. How do you introduce these uh, new technologies to seniors? Because, you know, I, I, as we just said, they're going to probably be some of the more tougher customers to embrace technology. You know, either it's a lack of access to, or they're just afraid of it, you know, or it's difficult. Um, so give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, having, having been in this world of elderhood for the last decade, um, I fully recognize that there are some who are going to be resistant. Um, and it has to do with some of the cognitive and physical decline uh, that we that that we experience as we get older. Okay. And of course, if your eyesight isn't as good, if your hearing isn't as good, and if you're uh, suffering some cognitive decline uh, that's associated with diseases like dementia, mm -hmm. um, it certainly can make it very challenging to use our devices, especially sure. if you if you haven't grown up with them, mm -hmm. if you don't have that muscle memory of right. of reaching to your smartphone for the information that it can provide. Um, that is a challenge that is slowly getting less and less. That okay. hurdle is lowering as, um, as the baby boomers and then the subsequent generations are aging into elderhood. They have grown up with this and are accustomed to using it. So, for instance, my mother is 80 years old, mm -hmm. and you will never find her without her iPhone. <laughs> and that is that uh, describes, I think, a large percentage of the elders in our world today. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're if you're of the silent generation or the greatest generation, uh, you're 90, 95, 100 years of age, and you didn't grow up with one of these things and have never used it, it's going to be a real challenge for you to uh, learn how to use a smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, but anytime we've got a new technology, so for instance, some of the in-home monitoring mm -hmm. 
that can help elders and their families uh, stay at home, age in place, maintain their independence and vitality. Anytime we're introducing new technology like that, um, it requires um, it requires the family and the individual to uh, be patient, go slowly, um, and work within the uh, capacity that the individual patient uh, brings to the table. Okay. Um, so, so a ninety-year-old who wants to do it, wants to learn how to use their new device or uh, a new technology. Um, of course, we're going to uh, help him or her in the best manner possible. And somebody else who is just resistant to it or for whatever reason doesn't want to do it, we have to respect their wishes and sure. say, well, maybe this isn't for them and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, look elsewhere for a solution. And so these challenges have to be individualized, but there are things that we can do um, from, a, from a general level to help incorporate these uh, wisely and, and with the, the, the proper support of the elder. What is the future of technology for senior healthcare? What does it look like? Oh, I think, I think there's um, a lot to be optimistic about uh, regarding the future. You know, for instance, um, uh, we've got a neighbor here in the greater met metropolitan area by the name of Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Musk is just uh, a tremendous individual who has so many great ideas. And uh, I'll just name three of them. Uh, number one is the uh, Tesla automobile and the automatic driving. Mm -hmm. um, so think about the idea that an elder who no longer has the capacity to drive but someday might be able to just punch up where he or she wants to go, i.e. to the grocery store or to the coffee shop to meet a friend or to the doctor to see me. Mm -hmm. And he pushes a button and then a few minutes later, a vehicle shows up at the front door or at the uh, curb. They get into the vehicle and uh, it automatically drives them to their destination. They get out and then they do it in reverse an hour later whenever they're done with the appointment. That is one technology that is almost here. Um, and in fact, if you go to some jurisdictions right now, you can, you can make that happen. Okay. Um, another, an, another technology that uh, Tesla is developing is a Tesla robot. And uh, uh, Elon Musk just introduced that, I believe, this year, earlier this year. And uh, the robot technology and the uh, technology that they've used with automatic driving that will be applied to robots um, has tremendous potential regarding caregiving and the needs that elders will have in the home that we don't have enough humans to meet all those needs. And so if we have a robot that can help us get to the bathroom or take a shower, or change our clothes, change our bed, uh, that sort of thing. That is certainly on the, on the horizon as well. Um, that that would, would be a game changer. Oh, absolutely yeah, a game changer. Because they could have stay in their home. I mean, yeah, exactly. It, would, it increases their independence, right? Yeah. And it maintains it, their independence. And, and like I mentioned earlier, there's nobody wants to end their life in a nursing home. Sure. Everybody absolutely. wants to be at home mm -hmm. and independent. Yeah. And uh, the robot technology and the other in-home aging in place technologies that are available is, uh, is able to help us achieve that. And then finally, there's uh, uh, Neuralink, uh, the interface uh, between the brain and technology uh, that Neuralink is working on. And it's uh, already producing results in certain diseases. And the potential there is just uh, is quite dramatic. Would that be something like uh, for Parkinson's? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I think I had a, I saw a demonstration mm -hmm. recently, um, and they had to, you know put something into their uh, I forget what it's called. Um, yeah, they're putting they're putting stimulators exactly into directly into the brain into the area where there is some sort of a some sort of an anatomical deficit, mm -hmm. and by stimulating uh, through those wires, um, they can overcome a lot of pathology. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, he did a live demonstration. We were fortunate to have someone who has who had them implanted, and he was able to dial down mm -hmm. uh, the, the the assistance, 
And within less than 15, 20 seconds, you would saw the tremors start to come back, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was, it was was quite a fascinating uh, observation to, to see him go through that. And then, um, you know, he was, he was able to communicate with us and tell us what he was feeling. And then they were, he was like, okay, I'm ready to go back. And yeah. they dialed it back up and then he was fine. It was, it was tremendous. So. Yeah, there's, there, there are lots of reasons to be optimistic. Yeah, that's yeah. tremendous. Uh-huh. What about apps? What, what sort of, what, if people wanted to get out there now and start looking at different things, you mentioned the Apple Watch, that's certainly one. Uh, so anything else out there? So let me let me give your audience a few practical things that they can do now, preparing for the future. Okay, that sounds great. So um, as the as the technology advances, there are already a myriad of apps, uh, either on the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store, mm-hmm. uh, that are available right now. Um, but for those of us who are thinking about their years 5, 10, 15 years from now, um, these smartphones are absolutely uh, one of the things that you should get comfortable using. And in order to use them well, you've got to be comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. And so you don't have to do everything on there, uh, but I would advise you to get a phone um, that you that has the capacity to do things uh, like play games, for instance, or to pick one or two apps, one or two things that you might want to do with the phone, and then just search it and try to find something for you to get comfortable using this interface, using this device. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of other things. Number two is... Uh, you got to have a good Wi-Fi environment in your home. Mm-hmm. If you have good Wi-Fi, uh, then your connectivity is going to be better and the seamlessness between your device, between your computer or your phone and the internet is going to be is going to be better. Now, uh, then it brings up the issue of, well, the connectivity and people watching you mm-hmm. and, uh, and that sort of thing. But there's ways around that. And learning how to do that now when you're... 55 or 60 or 65 is far easier than when you're 80, 85, sure. 90. Yes. And then finally, make friends with your grandchildren. Your grandchildren are little technology experts, and they can come and rescue you whenever you're uh, fumbling. Um, I don't have grandchildren yet. I hope uh, that's in my horizon, but I do have children, and I use them for that purpose. Uh, be good friends with your grandkids and they'll help you out. Excellent. Because you will get stuck. <laughs> That's terrific. Well, uh, anything else that you need to sh- would like to share with us today? Uh, to um, just there? embrace your elderhood, uh, your elder years. Um, they can be the best years of your life. And uh, technology is uh, providing us great tools to make those years better and uh, go into those years wide open and uh, boldly. Well, thank you so much. I learned quite a bit today. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with me today and and, and give us an overview of the technology and the intersection with healthcare. This has been tremendous. I learned a lot. I hope you did too. Please, uh, we want to wish you a happy holiday season. We thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to uh, see you back here very soon. Have a great day. Bye now.